welcome to the last presentation today. Happy to have uh, Gerardo here. Uh, he's contributing on uh, behalf of uh, Siemens uh, to GitLab, uh, explaining us the story about uh, protected packages. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everybody. So uh, after two days of open source at Siemens, uh, my head is kind of like really uh, full with a lot of new impressions. So I might have forgotten all my slides and all, all the things that I wanted to present. But anyway, let's do this. Um, I have a confession to make in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning of my career as a software engineer, um, I made a little bit of a mistake with uh, a slightly inconvenience for the other team um, because I at one point, I decided to do a git force push of an unfinished branch to the master. And uh, this was uh, not a good idea, I can, <laughs> as you all know. Um, exactly, and the project maintainers, they came to me and they, were, and they looked at me and were saying like, no, it was not good, it was not good. Um, we have to make sure that uh, this, not, this is, does not happen again. And uh, let's protect this branch. Let's protect the master branch. And this is a feature that, is, that has always been or has been available for a long time in GitLab. Uh, a few years, I, I think that probably most of you are also using protected branches. Yes? Okay. Good on you. Good. <laughs> um, uh, uh, some years later, some years later, I was in, a, in another project and I was uh, maintaining with the team. We were maintaining uh, uh, NPM packages on the GitLab package re registry. And I was doing some maintenance tasks, uh, like uh, yeah, deleting some of the uh, some old uh, package versions. But uh, by accident, I, I swear it was really by accident. <laughs> it was really by accident. I also deleted uh, uh, yeah one the latest version of a package. And then the project maintainers came again to me, and they were looking at me and were like, "No, <laughs> this was not good. This was not good." Um, and I was saying, "Well, let's protect this package. Why don't we do this?" And they looked at me and they were like, no, because this does not exist on GitLab. Uh, you cannot protect packages on GitLab because uh, on GitLab, it's like this, that you are only, that you're only able, as a de oh, when you are a developer, when you are a developer, you are able to push, to update, to delete the, project, uh, the package on the package registry as you want. And this situation uh, uh, is not the only situation, uh, um, this requirement, the package protection requirement, uh, was not only necessary in this situation, it was also necessary inside of Siemens. And the code.siemens.com team uh, decided that, well, we want to make a contribution, an effort to protect you, to protect the packages, to protect the teams uh, from those uh, yeah, uh, silly mistakes uh, like the ones that I made. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and this talk is about uh, our journey of contributing the protected package feature to GitLab. Uh, and I wanted to walk you through a few learnings, a few, uh, the few of the steps, uh, so that you might get a glimpse into how the process actually works um, exactly. But before I do that, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm Gerardo. I'm part of a, a small three-person team of experienced uh, full-stack software engineers. And we uh, help organizations uh, to, um, to do uh, open source contributions, but also to, uh, to support them throughout their uh, open source initiatives. Uh, in this case for Siemens, it's uh, helping uh, Siemens or, or contributing on behalf of Siemens. And yesterday, Thomas uh, from uh, Celium mentioned something, uh, mentioned the golden dashboard of uh, Google for the site uh, reliability. Well, monitoring, and this is not a golden dashboard, but this is a golden triangle. So <laughs> it starts here at the code.siemens.com team. Um, many Siemens people uh, uh, create new issues, create bug reports, but also feature requests on the code.siemens platform. The team, uh, Roger, Fabio, and everybody else, reviews them. We discuss this together, and then we decide to make an effort to contribute to, in this case, GitLab uh, to this. I, I'm in charge of uh, doing all the merge requests, doing the changes, and bringing them in as fast as I can. Uh, and in the end, uh, GitLab, uh, once the changes are merged, it will get released with the next community edition, and then the code.siemens uh, platform gets updated, and we have this new feature. So um, how, do I, or how do I approach uh, this kind of contribution? Because to be honest, it's a bigger contribution, so it's not a small, tiny little 
let's say, uh, fixing, uh, fixing a small uh, typing error. <laughs> it's a little bit more complex than this. So the first thing that I would really recommend to everybody is to always start with an issue. An issue is the way for an open source project, or for that matter, for any kind of project, to really manage the requirements, the things that the project has to do. So please really create an issue uh, when you start working on a project. In this case, I did not have to create. I did not have to create an issue because it was already there for three years. Uh, Tim Rizzi, a product manager in GitLab, uh, already created this issue. Or it's not even an issue, it's an epic in that case. And uh, he, there was a full-fledged, um, uh, let's say, yeah, uh, rough, rough estimate of what needs to be done. Here you see a small proposal uh, on the, um, uh, yeah, at, at the bottom of the screenshot. Um, and uh, the first thing that you have to do is you either create the issue or, well, at first you try to find the issue through Google or through GitLab. <laughs> uh, and then once you find it or you do not find it, you create it, uh, you start understanding what are the requirements, what are actually the concerns, what are the hurdles, what are the thoughts that uh, people have already contributed to this epic in that case, but to the issue in general. You try to understand the scope and you also try to contribute with your own thoughts, with your own ideas and also with your own uh, agreements and confirmation that yes, this is, uh, this is a problem. Uh, and this is what we also did from our side, that yes, this is a problem that we want to face, that we are facing uh, in our, at the, at the code.siemens platform, uh, and we would like to work on this. And this is also the next step, uh, or th this brings me to the next step. We start, the second step is to collaborate. And the first thing that you need to, or that I would recommend you to do, is express your desire to work on this, because this helps the project management uh, side uh, of the, um, so in, in this case, the GitLab team to, to really plan ahead and to plan resources and to understand that somebody is willing to contribute to this and, uh, yeah, and allocate resources and have this in, in their heads, in their minds, uh, when you start uh, yeah, creating merge requests and they give, you, or they give you a little bit more interest in that case. So I really recommend to express your interest to work on this, also for bugs, also for, for epics like this. And you start discussing and collaborating and engaging with the GitLab team to, um, about the scope. What needs to be done? What are, the, uh, what are certain hurdles that some of the GitLab team members can already foresee? Because of course they work with their platform all the time. And they, of course they also know way better what needs to be tackled and where we need to put a certain attention on. Um, so engage with the team. Be open to, for example, in this case, I reached out saying like, yes, I would like to work on this. Here's a rough, uh, rough implementation plan um, to, get the to get the discussion starting. And Tim Rizzi responded, yeah, awesome. Uh, would you mind having a short uh, video call on this? Which makes sense because it was a, a bigger feature. And then we discussed this together with Tim Rizzi and uh, David Fernandez, who, is also, who also lives in, in Switzerland. Uh, if you look, uh, hi, David. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, we had a, we had a, short, um, a short video call, like elf, uh, 11 months ago, elf, 11 months ago, <laughs> and, uh, and we discussed rough the implementation roadmap for this. And um, so this, this goes back and forth. It's not like a synchronous com communication. Uh, Raymond uh, said that it's like a remote setup, so it's really asynchronous communication. So it goes back and forth uh, through the collaboration. And during that time, you... I would not recommend you to idle, especially not when you're tackling a bigger feature. I would recommend you to do a proof of concept, a technical spike, or as Harald uh, mentioned this morning, a proof of crash as well. And uh, in, in this case, you, you just focus on the essentials as you always do with a technical spike or a proof of concept. You focus on the essentials. So this is a time where you really don't care about tests. You do not care about... Uh, uh, about the fancy UI. In this case, it's just getting the bare minimum to work. And this is what I also did here. And I would actually recommend to also, uh, when you are working on other bigger features, to do this and to share the uh, proof of concept also early on with the GitLab team in that case to get, um, to get early on feedback. Are you going into the right direction? Because, I mean, they know their platform better than you do. So uh, if, you, if you give them like a, like a proof of concept where they can um, discuss uh, or where they can see where you are going, they will understand uh, what are the what might be roadblocks that you might uh, uh, stop, uh, stumble upon. 
Um, so I really recommend to do a proof of concept uh, and ask for early on feedback. And also uh, the proof of concept gives you the, the possibility to define the scope, the effort, and really get an idea how much work needs to be done. And out of this, a whole list of other issues came along and a, and a whole implementation roadmap was um, yeah, designed or uh, planned for the, for the feature with the backing of the GitLab team, which was really awesome. Um, so we, had, uh, we have like three steps, issue, collaborate, and proof of concept. And the last one is to actually implement the thing. And this is what uh, I've been doing. And this is now at the moment the result. So the, um, at the moment it's a part of, it's already part of GitLab, but it's behind the feature flag. So it's not currently not enabled on code.dmats.com. We'll get to this at the end of this, uh, of this slide. Maybe we can release it. Um, we will definitely release it in a few, um, in a few months maybe, let's see, <laughs> but it's already there and it looks like this. It, is, uh, it, is a, uh, it looks similar to the protected branches feature that I mentioned in the beginning. So you, you have the possibility to, um, to define the package names or you define package name patterns also with, an, with a wildcard uh, pattern to enable to protect packages which have like a SHA, uh, a random SHA uh, at the end, for example, or a random prefix in the beginning. Um, and you then, you then define the package type. In this case, it's MPM. And then you define which uh, user roles are able or are not able to push and delete the uh, package. And this is how we protect things. So in this case, and you can see it here in the bottom, maybe not from the back, but uh, when you try to push, um, to push the package at Siemens, open source at Siemens, <laughs> um, and you are, uh, yeah, and when you try to push this, any kind of user of the project will not be able to push to this, to this project because, because it is protected by this package protection rule. And this is basically the same pattern that you also know from protected branches, where you can do this on branch level. We brought this to the package registry. Exactly. So um, one of the learnings, and now I'm going a little bit more into my best practice or my learnings, my insights that I would like to share with you is that um, it was also mentioned during this open source conference that open source is not only about the technical side, about implementing things, it's a lot about the community and a lot about the people. And when you interact with people, one important aspect is communication. And I cannot stress this enough. Uh, Raymond also expressed this uh, during his talk. It's really about uh, communicating efficiently because uh, in at, uh, working on GitLab, and it's the same for every other open source project, you work remotely and asynchronously with your other open source team members or with the community. And in this case, I can definitely assure that it makes sense to put some effort into the, into the messages that you, or into the comments, into the communication with the other side. So include visuals, include concrete uh, screencast, other visuals to make clear what you want to express. In this case, there's not a, a visual, so I made a bad job here, but in this, in this screenshot. But uh, in general, it's a really good uh, recommendation to include visuals, to make, it, uh, to make it more tangible for the other side to understand what you're doing. It's your job. It's your job as a contributor to, to be understood by the other side. So I really recommend this. Um, and there's also, like really small things that we all should consider and keep in our heads, keep the sentences short so that people can understand you. This is like 101 communicating with everybody. So keep it short uh, to, to make us uh, use simple language in that case to, uh, to, to express your ideas. Apply formatting like bullet points helps a lot to, keep, to get a visual, uh, visual separation of the thoughts and to a clear line of thought. Uh, include a call to action. So for example, in this case, uh, the GitLab colleague, uh, Marcel, uh, van Remmerden, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, he, at the end of, of, of his comment, he put a question mark so that I was, uh, so he gave me a call to action to really respond to this, to this question. Uh, and you should also consider this when you write a mess, uh, message or a comment. Uh, do you include a call to action so that the other side knows what he or she has to do uh, with your comment. Um, also include background information. Context is relevant. 
uh, Raymond was also mentioning this. Thank you, Raymond, for this awesome, <laughs> for this awesome uh, uh, base uh, presentation for, for my talk. So include context information. To have a shared reality, he was talking about this, um, uh, that you can actually reference. In this case, uh, it's just like including more context information so that people can better understand where you're coming from and where you're going. Um, exactly. And because uh, communication is so important, I, um, I decided to include another, uh, another hint. The, the second hint is also about communicating. Um, always assume positive intent. So uh, when you are working on, uh, in, in an open source context where people that you do not see, maybe not even ever, yeah, hopefully at least once, um, you have to assume you do yeah, you have to assume positive intent. Like they do not want to, to have anything, or they don't have anything against you. So don't take it very personally. Just take it on a, keep it on a neutral level and assume a positive intent that they, that everybody wants to be constructive and wants to push forward with the project. Um, uh, exactly. So in this case, uh, Marcel just uh, um, mentioned or was, uh, um, was, was trying to, um, to, to, to express that he understands where I'm coming from and where I'm going, but uh, uh, nevertheless, he expressed some, uh, some concerns and some questions in his bullet, in his bullet points there. Yeah. But always assume a positive intent in a sense that, uh, yeah, saying that, yeah, the questions are valid and that I accept them and uh, let's continue working on those. Um, a friendly and responsible inclusive communication is also key. Those are also values of, the, um, of GitLab. Yes, I read the, uh, the GitLab handbook. Um, <laughs> headbook to some extent, not everything, but uh, at least some parts, and there um, it's definitely included in there. Um, what I can also recommend is ping and mention certain people. So when you are not that familiar with uh, collaborating with with certain platforms in GitLab on code.siemens, uh, it's definitely possible to ping and message certain uh, certain message uh, certain persons, and they will get a notification, an email. They will they will they will receive. And so they know uh, that they need to look at this. So really use this and not just, uh, and, and don't forget about those, um, those pings because um, otherwise some messages might get lost and then you lose some time on this and we do not want this. Uh, what I also found quite, uh, quite helpful is to, uh, to include, like, yeah, to quote uh, certain, certain things from previous messages so that you make it really clear that you're answering to this point um, and, and really improve the communication in that sense and make it more efficient. This is uh, all that I want. And the last thing I would really, uh, I, have, I have not seen it everywhere, but, uh, but I would really like to point out and, and recommend to include as much direct links as possible. Uh, in GitLab, but also on other platforms, you can reference certain messages, certain comments with a link Make the effort, go to the, for example, when you're on Slack, uh, you can go there, you can copy the link to a certain message. When you're on, on, on GitLab or on code.siemens, you can uh, copy the, um, the URL uh, for each comment that a person has done. Include it there because this makes the communication really precise and people know what you're actually referencing. Instead of saying, yes, you wrote above, you wrote something like this, you can actually really say like, yes, here's the link. Um, you can click on it and then you, are, you jump directly to the comment and everybody knows what, you, what you're referring to. So it's really a small thing, but those small things adding up will, I'm, uh, I'm a firm believer of this, that, that it will really optimize the process, the way of communicating and the, and, and, and the speed of, of, um, of getting uh, contributions into GitLab, but also for other projects as well. Um, I can take a whole bunch of other learnings, but uh, I mean, this is the last talk and uh, yeah, I do not want, uh, I also want to, to, to finish. So I just took three and the other one is um, when you are working on open source and now on GitLab and especially for this, for, for this feature, I decided to work really in parallel. I think you can apply this to different, uh, to also other software projects in general. Work in parallel, what does it mean? You can stack up multiple MRs uh, that are kind of like follow-ups. You can stack them up while the first one is reviewed. In this case, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pointing at, um, at, one, at, at one certain M MR sequence that consists of three parts, and then you can stack them up so that you uh, stack up all the necessary MRs in, in, in one go, in one go, and then once the first one is released, you can rebase the other one and, and continue. So working in parallel, 
helps a lot, helps speeding up the process, and it, and it also uh, helps to involve, uh, to involve other reviewers in your contribution journey um, so that to speed up basically the whole process. Um, you, don't, you do not need to, or it's, it's possible to stack up the uh, DMRs for one specific feature or for, for one specific merge sequence, but you can also just start working in another part of the code base. So while I'm working on uh, protected packages, there's also another aspect that, uh, that we're working on, protected containers, which is basically kind of the same kind of idea, uh, but in a di completely different area. So other people are involved, and this way you can also make it more efficient to collaborate with the GitLab team. Besides this one, there are also other bug reports, performance issues that I have been tackling or that we decided to tackle, and those are also other areas of the GitLab code that you can work on while your other, uh, your, your OpenMRs are reviewed and, um, and yeah, and this really helps up to speed the process. And to this, uh, I come to an end. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, or we are not exactly sure when, uh, when protected packages, uh, when we will release protected packages, but I think it will be probably in the next uh, releases or so, where we will enable the feature flag for protected packages on code.siemens. So we, will, we might be the first ones uh, of the GitLab universe that will have protected packages, yay! And, um, and yeah, with this I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Thoughts? Contribute with me, come on. <laughs> Engage! <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so one thing I noticed was that you can create packages without, with the CI job token, but unfortunately, uh, once you created that, you cannot delete that with the same token again. Is, are there any plans to fix that inconsistency? Uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I do not think that this is actually... Um, or, open an issue, and we can discuss this. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware, I've, I, have not, I have not been tackling this kind of uh, merge request as part of this contribution. Yeah, it's actually more like a conceptual thing as the um, packages, you, I mean, you manually need to delete them if you create them in the CI, otherwise they just will pile up. Yes. But for that cleanup action, you need more rights than for the creation, and this is sometimes a bit cumbersome to handle. Uh, thanks for the input. Um, We'll probably, yeah, we'll have to look into this. Uh, but those are exactly the things that we want to put effort in. Yes, create an issue and then we can discuss it. <laughs> um, I don't have to say anything. I just wanted to say thank you because I'm reviewing quite a lot of MRs from you. Um, so it was nice to meet you. I'm stacking them up, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm pretty sure I will have a new one tomorrow when I'm back at work, so. Keep up the good work, thanks. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks again for the great work. And uh, just to let you know, you are not the only one who deleted uh, packages. <laughs> I recently did as well with the friendly help of uh, GitHub uh, official action. So the story behind this is something, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Um, we had a couple of uh, multi-arch packages on GitHub. Um, and we tried to clean up, good citizen, a few gigabytes. Um, uh, and the problem was that actually that uh, the packages still left the metadata, but the underlying multi-arch uh, containers were gone. Uh, fortunately, people really no quickly noticed and I could stop the whole thing, at least to a good shared degree. Is this a problem that you are also have to address in the, in the context of the container registry for GitLab? that if you have multi-arch packages there, um, that you may have to, you, you catch the, the metadata, but you may lose the underlying containers, actually. Is this something already taken care of, just to avoid that this mistake happens again? So when you delete uh, some, the container, that the metadata is also... Metadata has to be protected, but also the containers underneath for the different architectures. 
this is not something that I've been working on in the okay. last in the last months. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you're not the only. I have heard this last yeah, year as well Silvana from. Brought it up. <laughs> from uh, yeah, I think yeah, I think Konrad mentioned this last year actually okay. also as well. Okay. Good. So there are people already aware of this <laughs> yeah. because yeah, it can be get nasty. Yeah. And GitHub still hasn't fixed it. And maybe one one little add-on. Um, you're also working on protected containers. Exactly. Right. Ah, exactly. By the way. <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, and I would say thank you very, very much, uh, Gerardo. <laughs> for the